of the questions that no atheist will be able to answer. I don't know, but I can't wait to find out. A. How did existence emerge out of no space and no time? How can an atheist assume that his atheism is valid when the moment of the start of existence is a stark proof on the creativity of the Creator and his ability to originate existence? First of all, did you just assume God's gender? Secondly, this is a first cause argument. And while I will readily admit that science doesn't have anything concrete for how the universe came to existence in the exact millisecond that it did, our best working model is the Big Bang. And we know a lot about that event, down to the last few microseconds before the event that caused the universal expansion we know of today. While we can't identify a first cause, neither can you. You can say that we don't know all you like, and you'd be correct. But we can say the exact same thing about you. The difference between us is that you're lying to yourself and your audience by stating that it must be a deity. It doesn't have to be a god or gods. And while we don't know, neither do you. B. How did no life transform into life? How did matter mutate from lifelessness into living cell? With all our techniques and advancements, we cannot, till this very moment, originate the simplest form of life. So how can we explain the origination of life in the dead matter? Wouldn't we have been at least able to originate a form of life that supersedes the one that originated in the dead matter by at least a million times? Abiogenesis. In an enclosed environment with only inorganic matter, the Miller and Urey experiments were able to generate simple organic molecules and amino acids from essentially a bunch of gas and water. Using just inorganic materials hypothesized to have been on the old Earth, we managed to generate some of the necessary building blocks to life. While abiogenesis is still a working hypothesis that has not been promoted to a theory, it did manage to prove that we can do this with what you so inappropriately deem as dead matter. You're zero out of two so far. Next. C. How can the atheist argue against the annihilation of all mankind? What is the rational, substantial, and scientific evidence an atheist can present to prove that annihilation of all mankind is a mistake? The material world knows no right and wrong, so annihilation of mankind must be equal to keeping them alive from their perspective. Oh goody! We've jumped headfirst into the moral argument! Here's the thing about morals. Morals are ideas of right or wrong agreed upon by groups of individuals. Morality is, as far as I can tell, very subjective to culture and individuals, but they're usually associated with a want with a want to sustain both oneself and the group on the whole, since keeping the group alive benefits the self just as much as it does the group. And by benefiting yourself, you can then procreate to swell the numbers of the group, further aiding in the survival of the group and yourself, and then the human race as a whole. Even the lowest of land mammals exhibits this type of altruism, selfish or not, in some form or fashion. We've just evolved as a social species to focus on the group aspect of survival as much as on the individual aspect. So in short, we evolved that way. D. Atheism assumes that human beings are just animals who came into existence after a long and slow sequence of evolution from meaner beings. So what if a higher being came into existence? Will it have the right to put us all in cages and use us as lab rats? The Darwinist answer that we derive from matter is yes. So what I'm getting out of this one is that you're taking the basic moniker of Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest, and taking a straw man version of that moniker to its logical conclusion. But since you're arguing against a straw man, this point is automatically invalid. In evolution, there are no higher beings. Evolution doesn't take place on a ladder. It's more accurately represented as a giant bush with several million twigs and lines branching off in millions of different directions. Nothing in that model is higher or lower, so to speak. If a species were more advanced than us technologically, perhaps your question about using us as lab rats in cages would have some merit, but ideas like slavery of this kind is something humankind has already dealt with in the past. We've determined in most advanced societies that slavery is wrong and abysmal, since it imposes your will on another human's rights. Evolution being taken into account, no one is higher or lower than anyone else on the planet, as far as human beings are concerned, so there's no justification for slavery on moral grounds. 
so, what's the purpose from protecting mankind or providing them with meaning or purpose when it comes to atheism? Nothing. Atheism's job isn't to provide purpose. It's an answer to a question. It isn't even a worldview. You're attaching a lot of baggage onto a concept that isn't even an epistemology in and of itself. Atheism here is unable to explain the reality of man. E. What if, according to evolution, we proved that one race is higher than the other? Will the higher race be entitled to transform the lesser race into used matter, as we do with the lesser insects or animals? Again, the Darwinist answer is yes. This very argument is enough to obliterate atheism from any mind that utilizes common sense, since the only criteria to judge who is better than who is the criterion of God-fearingness, not by color or strength. As I said before, Darwinian evolution does not posit any beings as higher or lower. It's simply that you are more or less related to one another. Aristotle posited the evolutionary ladder of animals, and it has been dismissed by the scientific community. So on this point, fuck off. Also, nice way to sneak in your theistic dogmatic bullshit into the question. Very subtle. Again, fuck off. F. Atheists argue that morals are relative, meaning can be seen from more than one perspective. So, honesty can be better than betrayal, or betrayal can be better in some cases. Yet, when confronted with their own trials, they claim outright that morality is objective, and that things like honesty or betrayal are absolute. Because, if morals are relative, then immorality makes no sense, since we will never be able to set a line between morality and immorality. This is definitely a clear contradiction, because if morality was objective and absolute, then this law of morality must have had a lawgiver, the will of Allah, and divine accountability. If morality was relative, then no atheist must complain from immorality or even comprehend its concept. So, we're back to the moral argument again, and I see that now that we're further in the video, you're smuggling in more of your dogma. If morality is relative, but it's relative to the culture, then you can claim that morality is objective within that culture. But it still makes morality subjective to that culture. But objective within the culture. The difference in our positions is that with relative morality, the buck stops in multiple places based on circumstance. But for you, the buck stops at God, a God who you can't prove. Also, you managed to use a concept that we in the West like to call no atheist in foxholes. It basically states that when the going gets rough, an atheist will turn to God for help. This not only doesn't happen in reality, as hardships make many theists lose their faith as much as it makes atheists convert, it also amounts your religion to no more than a crutch to get you by when bad things happen. Now, I'm not saying that that analogy is inaccurate. I think faith is just that. It's a crutch. The problem is, it's a crutch you use when you don't realize that both of your legs are working just fine. You just have people telling you that they're broken, and you think you need the crutch. It's kind of sad, really. G. How did the amazing constants of physics emerge? All of these constants entail very intricate differences that must never vary, even by the slightest or minutest fraction, or the whole universe would collapse. For instance, the cosmological constant is fine-tuned to 120 decibel places, and if it was one decibel more or less, the whole universe would collapse. This precision proves that accuracy of a great maker, noting that the constants are numerous in physics and all of them are intricately precise. So, the argument for fine-tuning? This is another classical apologetics argument. And truly, honestly, the chances of the universe being the way it is today are one in several trillion. But here's the thing about chances. If you have 13 billion years and you're rolling dice, eventually you're gonna hit the number you need. Also, the only reason numbers that we rolled seem significant is because they're our numbers. Any hand you draw from a deck of cards has a 1 in over 2 million chance of being drawn. It's highly unlikely, but you drew that hand. It only really seems special because we've attached meaning to those numbers after the fact. H. 
How did the genome emerge within the living cells? A code must require a coder, and this genome designates what each cell will be used for. Doesn't this prove that there is a unique maker dictating very specific codes? Evolution. Evolution is the process in which single-celled organisms become multicellular and then diversify from there. The only reason the genome looks like a code is because we've attached meaning to it after the fact. Again. Please stop doing this. I. Where did morality and values come from? When it comes to atheism, atheism sees the universe as a tumultuous sea of atoms that makes no sense and have no purpose which was one of the driving motives to immorality and depravity. But since morality does exist, then atheism is invalid. Uh, are you just restating the fucking moral argument again? This is artificial padding. If you want an answer to this question, please just rewind the video. To sum up our argumentation against atheism, since there is light, then there has to be a source for this light. Since there is shade, then there has to be a body causing the shade. Since there are intricate objects starting from the quarks and ending with the galaxies, then there has to be an originator. Incorrect. There may have been an originator, but there is no argument that can prove that there must have been an originator. And even if you proved that, you would have all your work cut out for you in order to say that that originator was any one god. Honestly, after this point, he just recites the Quran and says that it has the best arguments ever, which Christians claim about the Bible as well. You can't both be right, but you can both be wrong. Also, after reading some of the Quran, the last thing I want to do is have more of it read to me. So, no thanks. If you want that, the original video will be in the description. With that said, thanks to all of my subscribers for being here for me. Thanks to my new patrons, as well as the old ones alike, and if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and subscribe if you haven't already. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and I'll see you in the next one.